Um, here I'm trying to <coughs> present uh, some of the work we recently published in uh, molecular system biology um, in February. So the topic is modeling the mediated signal transduction in the system. Uh, it's a little bit different from the title I have um, for me to model the information flow. I guess this is just a slide. It's an old one. So from biological point of view, most of the events you're triggered by a signal transmission. It's a certain kind of stress or external aspect of signal transaction molecules or be in the confusion, all the so on and so forth. And then the signal will turn to the nucleus and then all the modification events be initially initiated or repressed. Of the key of our work is to monitor the signal of the molecules and the signal molecule. What the family of lipids called us refer and then we make prediction and to find out how to all the lipid is the information regarding the gene. How this information cells detect the information? The bottom line is that these chemicals, when they change the conformation of a particular form of the molecule, and the information. So we monitor the conformation of the chicken, reflect this as the um, signal. You know, and the relationship with the G prime. The system we use is a G Easter um, system. So Easter is the model cells, which is respond to the quite tough environment. So when Easter cell normally is growing, it's 30 degrees. It's, um, subject to the heat stress. So usually we reach the temperature 39 degree. And the series of programming will be initialized. And then you begin to see if we hit the cells with the heat stress, and then usually cells will rest at the G0 and G1 stage, not dividing anymore. And the nutrient permutation is permissive, begin to degrade, and stop the synthesis. And then trans there's a program of transcription regulation. Certain genes was turned on, the certain genes were turned off. And all this, and then also there's translation regulation, heat on protein induction, and all this metabolism change. In 1997, two independent groups found that all the process, it depending on the novel synthesis of lipids. So that is, if you know one gene that is involved in production of the, the lipids, the heat stress, all this program is in in a certain way. Let's see. And this is a simple schema of the sphingolipid metabolism. It's a normal metabolism. So when the cell is under stress, so permission to the uh, permission to the serine and a palmitoid CoA is increased, and this get an influx into the cells, and then synthesize the at the very beginning is the dihydrosphingosine. This is the yeast, and then as a hydrolyzed um, hydroxyl group added as a form of the phytosphingosine. And this can flock to the ceramide, so sphingosine, and this is phytosphingosine. A, a protein, um, a lipid species in particular of interest to us is phytosphingosine 1-phosphate. We are interested in this as because people are in the momentum there are membrane receptor for this molecule, which has um, involved in the cancer and the vascular uh, vascular gen uh, genesis. And but in the east, people think, say this species, this lipid species, have no function. So we're interested in this, and then we begin to try if we knock out this gene, which is a it's a kind of so produced the phosphate, and we knock out this gene, and we try to clamp this, and then we can try to monitor what's the impact on our gene expression, mm -hmm. and if this have an um, effect on gene expression. Mm -hmm. So the strategy we 
we adopted is to try to, first we perturb the sphincterlipid metabolism by, by physical stimulation, heat stress. And also we collect certain lipids by gene mutation. And then we begin to collect the both the lipidomic data and the gene expression data, which I just can use in a modeling approach to identify potential information contained to omic data. And then we begin to so come further to meta using a uh, statistical model to model the states, activation states of transcriptor. Uh, that's pretty much as a constant topic of a previous talk. So we trying to see if we can predict this, and then we begin to can monitor uh, further to infer the information flow from, from the stress to lipid profile and state transition factor and the gene expression. So the, this is a, the information we use and on the top. So pretty much this is the input, and then this will, as a, if this is a model, we will generate middle steps and which lead to the specific hypothesis, and then we test the hypothesis by the experiment data, uh, by performing experiments. So this is a pretty much a repeat description of what we did, is so we have a parental cells, and the cells with the LCB45 gene knockout, that means it prevent the production of um, phyto-S1P, and this is a <coughs> DPL1 knockout, which will prevent the de degradation of the S1P, phyto-S1P. And then we subject the cells to the heat stress and collect the time, scale, um, time series of the both the microarray and the lipidomic data. So when, when the cells are subject to over 1,000 diseases change, and this change can be compared to uh, LCB45 potential is the um, L1P sensitive gene of them. But if we just uh, further don't find some problems if we input the data. First, let's look at this is the mutation manipulates. You can just um, see the color. It's an interesting concentration. It's always subject to the heat stress. So you begin to see the concentration. You begin to increase and it begin to decrease. And as it was knocked out, the LCP45 mutation is positively elevated in the LPD on one condition, but also respond to the heat stress. If the if only lipid is changed, any, any gene is a sensitive differential expression to my type strain and the mutation strain is due to the, the lipid. Ordinarily, the mutate to the one species of the lipids, and which is you begin to find many relations to this, and the different mutation type you can see. So now you have a problem as the change to which lipid is is causing. So to identify the information, so we perform them at the very beginning as so the most simplest. Um, modeling is just to do the linear regression using the concentration of the lipids versus the gene expression to perform the regression. If it is a positive correlated, we can show this as a red one, and if it's a negative correlated, we show it as green. And then, so we have all the pairwise of the gene and lipids and regression values, the co um, coefficients, and then we cluster and we begin to find out that the, the lipids have a Names and similar profiles it seems to have a similar issue with respect of the genes. So, if we can think of this, one is one gene to see what kind of information a lipid potential has with respect to this gene. So, a block of this is a potential, a block of the potentially influenced by this. And you might be say, okay, correlation not really indicate a causality, but a but note that that's enough. We explicitly manipulated this lipid species. So this coefficient 
potentially indicated there's a causal relationship between the, the concentration of these lipids and the genes regulate potentially regulated by this. So we concentrate on this block of the genes which is a positive to them. To further say, this is can be the relationship can be the modeling can be further relaxed using the nonlinear, and that's what an ongoing work we are doing. <coughs> so can give you, uh, uh, we try to visualize uh, a data. This under the genes, which is the squares in this graph, and uh, we also try to detect genes to their genes on top, and we found out the subgraph and then all the genes on top, how we'll connect all these genes in the minimum. And it's pretty much realized to see on the gene on the domain, how the genes are related to each other. If you have the genes, which is the blocks, and this red is the gene ontology annotation, so you begin to say, okay, this are similar function, and their relationship it can be also say even entity with different function annotation. But if the geotar is closely related, functionally close, these guys are close. So these are all the genes sensitive before five addition. but turn out to be only a slowly correlation. That is a have no uh, correlation with respect to potential the guys potentially is not really their change is because of mutation caused a widespread change in the lipid and those are just side effects rather than just a constant real one so trying to put this hypothesis and by doing certain experiments. So these are so those are the gray boxes which we know is not positive correlate to the S1P. And then we treat the cells with a vehicle and uh, extracellularly applied the PA and we begin to see, okay, indeed this uh, really induces the gene expression, but uh, and this is not significant change after the treatment. Okay. So there's a just, no, that means uh, these genes are not differentially responding to the S1P. On the other side, those are the genes that have a positive correlation. If we treat the cells with S1P, we begin to see there's a fold of changes in the of, of the kind of expression. So this is an indication these genes are really responding to the, to the production of the S1P. And this is another validation experiment we try to, to use the precursor of the S1P to treat the cells. And normally the cells can turn this precursor as dihydrosphingosin, a phytosphingosin, into the phytosphingosin 1-phosphate. And if it is in a mutation, it, this phosphorylation step was blocked. And indeed, we can see in the white type, if we use treat cells with precursor, we increase the expression. But in the white type, or in the knockout cells, this induction is disappearing. So it's a different way to just to indicate that these lipids are really doing certain things with these genes. The next thing we try is if we want to fill in at least one step between this expression, of course, the bottleneck of the information flow factor. So the stream factor have to be activated not to be regulated. So what we need to do is using a simple Factor. If it is open, that means it is not, not, not modified, so there is no gene expression, but it is fine, you begin to see. So, so medically, is as a regression, is to say, if the expression on a given microarray for a given gene, it is a several factors is the first thing we go through we consider all trans this transition factor have a binding site in this promoter second if this state of this transition factor is active or not and if this say and if the both have binding active and then you begin to 
observe the impact of this transferring factor on this gene. So this one is very nice. So we, we represent this as a binary variable and this variable. So you're going to say, I have or not, or active or not. So you begin to attract it will have an impact on the expression of a gene only if it has it and it's in the active state. So, so this naturally explains why. So we try to see, but unfortunately, we have this data, potentially have this data by looking up the database. And we need to estimate this because we do not monitor the fact activation state. We need to infer it. So, and we also need to wait. And we developed a probabilistic graphical model. It's basically, it's a, this is a, a node, it's a variable, and which will have, if we have arrow towards it, it means indicate it's a regularly have an impact on it. So this model can, can be represented this. And we developed some variation of basic inference and we began to inference the activation state of the each transfer factor on the given microarray based on the gene expression and the and genome. Of course, if we have additional data like the microsome, um, a nucleosome uh, modification, uh, potentially we can enhance the activation of the capability of estimating this. Estimate the action state, and we begin to estimate the, the, the weight. This is the transfer factor, the weight we're trying to. So, it's an algorithm. So, we model all this activation state across the time. Of Trigger factors, and we begin to see certain trigger factors. The, the red is active state in the resting state, so, but whenever you cell to heat stress, it, this guy's immediately turn off in five minutes. And certain trigger factors turn up in, within five minutes, and then this. So, if you look into this, many of this, and so many of these are stress responding factors as well documented. Now, the question is. If we measure the lipid and we estimate the transformation state, can we further say what's the relationship between lipid activation state? If we believe the lipid is influencing the activation of the transformation state, we eventually should be able to capture a um, mathematical relationship between them. This relationship usually can be modified, uh, can be read as a response function, uh, function, which is uh, if the, the x the lipid concentration, the activation state of this lipid, is this, this we have a dose relationship. It's a sigmoidal relationship which I don't begin to begin to inference. To say it's a very input and okay, a for this one is a negative impact on the impact. So the rows are transferred is the transfer factor and they call them. and this one has pulsing one phosphate. Then now so find Closing one phosphate and further on regulate the genes and all. Turn on the way look at how positive correlations the if it's three factors are significantly enriched, mean the active genes. Now we provide evidence. If you have just a of lead, this transfer will be activated. We further just not cut the transfer factors, sphingos and walls. And we begin to see 1.5 or 2 point some, but if we have all come, it's not counted. So that's another. The impact of the existence of outcomes. We summarize it, we just inherited the model domain, 
find from apps and uh, using a simple and surface statistical model, we begin to identify set of genes potentially by this, and we begin to see generate hypothesis that is potentially involved, and then potentially information flow from the stress to lipid change and gene expression. This is ongoing is just you can find out the modeling. What we did is uh, two original we using the depression data to try and uh, genomic data in the activation state, and uh, then we model the relationship. And I'm trying to see if we can model this in the unified mm -hmm. framework. And <coughs> it, this is an acknowledgement of the, my collaborators. So this work is done by two. So one my group is working on the computational aspect, and, and Dr. Ashley Kurt and Yusuf Hanoun is the biological collaborators. And you know, this is a very, at least it's a very interesting collaboration, and we are very pleased with the result. And of course, I would like to acknowledge my funding agent, the National Life of Medicine. Without their support, all this work it would be not possible. Um, I think. It, that's, uh, that's all I can have. To, so there's no chair. Uh, the ground is open for questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question about who used the lipidomic data. So. Um, I didn't quite understand uh, how you were treating the multiple species in the lipid data, uh, because um, I, I don't know this lipid too well, but I'm guessing it can have acyl chains, which have varying lengths. Yes. Um, and so are you treating the data from those different uh, lengths differently? Yes. Uh, at current stage, it's very simplistic. We treat the average species, particular chains, variation, all those things as an independent one. And we are developing the models to the group the ones which have similar head groups and physical, or physical chemical really as a group to model the, their potential functions. So I have a simple question. So for the activation state of transfer factor, you have two states or three states. So it's on, off, or it's positive one, zero, <coughs> minus one. Oh, we use the zero one, so it's a, it's a binary. So it's a, it's a model called uh, um, the factor model. <laughs> it's a zero and a one. And I think this makes sense. I, I know this model is quite related to the other similar model trying to estimate activation state of the transient factor, particularly network component analysis. I think the difference is uh, from biological point of view, the activation state of transient factor should not be negative. So the model should not entertain the negative states. And on the other side, it is a bit for the, if the transient factor is not activated, it's not activated. So it would not have any impact. So it should not have any negative impact on the, on the gene expression. So, I, so that's why we adopted this one. We, th we think that biologically, it doesn't make more sense. Although, the, you know, if we talk a little bit of detail, then so this binary model makes a lot of sense. And so really, we can talk later on if you're interested. OK. So and for the, if we phosphorate one transient factor, usually that will activate a transient factor, or it could also inhibit? Let's say uh, for individual transient factor, if it is a modified, usually you would consider the activation state is a switching between the two states. But, non, but if you treat the population of the transfer factor in the cell, and some are phosphorylated and some are not phosphorylated, and our, we are, our model will be able to entertain that as a percent of expected percent of phosphorylation, and then, so really, in our, um, excuse, so in our model, all the state, transfer factor state is really become a continuous value between zero and, zero and one. If it is a one, that means 100% of all transient factors is, is activated. If it is a 5.5, that means maybe half of the population of a transient factor is activated, the other half is not. So this way really reflected in the biological states and 
that is a, uh, that is a, their population of the molecules in the it's a mass action, not rather than single one switch on off. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Thank thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot.